HMS Hermes, the first aircraft carrier to be designed as an aircraft carrier, is the topic of today's video. Her design process was a long and torturous affair that would ultimately see the Japanese beat her to the punch with the commissioning of Hosho. Even so, while Hermes was late on her entry to service, she still retains her place as the earlier design. And that design itself, through all its twists and turns, is an interesting topic in its own right. Let's get into it. The design that would become HMS Hermes had its origins in the depths of the Great War. Initially designed in 1917, Hermes was originally going to be a seaplane carrier. A seaplane carrier with some interesting quirks, admittedly, mostly centered around how she would get her planes back aboard. Instead of a more traditional crane system, the original design for Hermes featured a submerged slipway at her stern. Aircraft could taxi inside the submerged area, where they would then be transferred to trolleys. The trolley would, in turn, carry the seaplane out of the water and into the hangar. This eliminated the need to have a cumbersome crane pulling the plane up to the deck from the water. It was an interestingly forward-thinking design, in a lot of ways, especially when coupled with a full-length flight deck, which could be used to operate both the seaplanes and regular aircraft alike. The combination of these features would allow for Hermes to do both seaplane carrier and aircraft carrier roles, while also having a way to more safely and securely recover her seaplanes. However, this design would not be long for the world. It was already being modified as early as 1918, when a rotating catapult was added to the bow. This was intended to allow Hermes to launch aircraft in any direction, regardless of wind, though I shudder to think of the complexity inherent in such a design, especially in 1918. Luckily for any poor engineers assigned to the ship, progress would prove to be very slow on Hermes' construction. She was laid down to her original design, with the fancy catapult, on January 15, 1918. However, as mentioned, her construction would be slow and leisurely at best. Even with World War I winding down, Resources for ship construction remain somewhat strained, especially with work on the conversion of Eagle and Argus taking up both the limited resources and shipyard time. Hermes was somewhat placed on the back burner in this regard while those conversions progressed. This would prove to be a good thing, though, in that it allowed for more time to tweak her design. Among other things, she lost the slipway and some of her secondary batteries. The biggest change, though, was in her superstructure. While this was still somewhat in flux at the time, Hermes shifted from a double island superstructure to a single island. That double island is an interesting design choice, but one that the Royal Navy was toying around with at the time, as Argus had a similar feature at one point. As all of this was going on, slow and steady work continued. Hermes would eventually be launched in September 1919, before promptly being laid up in dock for the next two years. This was intended to allow fly trials on Argus and the still incomplete Eagle. Through these trials, further changes could be made to Hermes, still far from completion. In the end, by 1921, the final changes had been made. Hermes would have a single island, similar in design, if smaller, to Eagles. This was mounted on her starboard side, and included two distinctive features, the single smokestack and a massive tripod mast. The latter was of a slightly different design to Eagle's similar mast, but was there for much the same reason. Fire control for her guns. Arguably excessive in its size, but this was a period of experimentation in a lot of ways. The final changes would be made to her aircraft lifts and secondary battery, along with her bow. In the case of the lifts, these were made larger to allow for easier stowage of aircraft, in addition to being moved further apart from each other so that Hermes had more space for her arresting gear. The secondary battery, meanwhile, was reduced to six 5.5-inch guns in single mounts with a handful of 4-inch anti-aircraft guns, either 3 or 4, though sources do vary on this. Hobbs, who I'm generally inclined to trust on these things, cites Hermes as carrying three such weapons. As for her bow, the flight deck was fared into it, and the rotating catapult was removed, which I'm sure made many a Royal Navy sailor 
breathe a sigh of relief. With her design finalized after many twists and turns, Hermes would complete her construction, finally being commissioned on February 18, 1924. By this point, the new carrier displaced around 11,000 tons on her standard loading, and nearly 14,000 tons on her full load. This displacement carried the aforementioned set of 5.5-inch and 4-inch guns, along with an armor belt of 3 inches. While on the subject of armor protection, Hermes also carried a 1-inch thick flight deck. You could make an argument calling her the first armored flight deck carrier, as a result, though she certainly wasn't intended as an armored carrier. In any event, that deck protected a hangar that was, even for 1924, small and cramped. As a direct result, Hermes could maybe manage 25 aircraft, if you really cram them in there. This isn't necessarily as bad as it sounds, as neither Argus or Eagle were much better. Even Furious, once she was finished as a proper carrier, only generally operated about 36 or so aircraft. That aside, to round off her design features, Hermes had an installed power plant of six boilers, producing 40,000 shaft horsepower through two shafts. This could get her to a nominal top speed of 25 knots, although she managed 26 on trials. That does round out the technical bits, though, so let's talk service history now. This would begin fairly slowly, as Hermes conducted her sea trials before joining the Atlantic fleet. Her time there would prove to be short, lasting for only a few months of training duty and working up, followed by a fleet review by King George V in July of 1924. With that work done, it was time for Hermes to leave the Atlantic and move to the Mediterranean. Here she would remain through the first half of 1925, continuing flying exercises and other training duties. Hermes would spend most of her career on such things, as even when she was commissioned, it was already apparent she was a bit small and outdated. Considering that such ships as the Lexingtons and Courageous entered service in the late 20s, this isn't surprising. Regardless, Hermes would spend her time in the Mediterranean, training her pilots and showing off the idea of an aircraft carrier to Mediterranean fleet officers. In this, she was joined by HMS Eagle, as the two carriers operated together for a couple months. In the end, though, Hermes' time in the Mediterranean would prove to be about as short-lived as her time in the Atlantic. By May of 1925, she was back in the UK for a short refit, before heading off to where she would spend the vast majority of her career. That being the China Station. There she would remain for much of the 1920s and 1930s, with the odd return home for dry dock time. Sometimes Hermes would venture to the Mediterranean as well, though these were generally short breaks in her Asian service. During her time in China, though, she at least got up to some interesting adventures. For example, in April of 1927, Hermes would support British forces around Shanghai during gang conflicts. And I've also seen reference to Hermes, with Argus, bombing a pirate base. Though I should note, I have not seen whatever source this originates from. The Shanghai thing comes from Hobbes, so at least I know where I can cite it. As for the pirates... Well, take that with a grain of salt. I'm not saying it didn't happen, though, so if you know the source of that story, by all means, let me know. Regardless, Hermes would leave China soon after, as Argus took her place on that station. By October 1927, she was back in Britain for a further refit. That would last until December, though Hermes would only be reassigned to China, again, in January of 1928. There she would remain, refits aside, for the first half of the 1930s. 1931, in particular, would end up being one of her more eventful years on the China Station. First, Hermes helped assist rescuers when the submarine HMS Poseidon sank off the Chinese coast in June. This would see six men plucked from the water, where they would be brought to Hermes' sickbay. Unfortunately, two of them would die aboard the carrier, despite the best efforts of her crew. The second major event, after that, came in September. Having sailed up the Yangtze River to help with flooding relief, Hermes put ashore marines to assist with the efforts, as well as putting the fear of God into some mutinous British merchantmen. An interesting note here other than that, though. During the relief efforts, Hermes would end up hosting Charles Lindbergh and his wife. 
They happened to be in the area on part of a world tour, and the carrier took aboard their modified Lockheed Sirius. This plane, equipped with floats, was lowered back into the water the next day, where it promptly capsized and had to be brought back aboard. It would remain there, along with the Lindberghs, until October 3rd, when Hermes returned to Shanghai and dropped them off, along with their damaged plane. Things more or less returned to the usual China station duties at that point, until Hermes returned home to Britain once again. This was in July 1933, where she ended up remaining for some time. She was able to get a long overdue, proper refit at this point. This, among other things, saw modern arrestor gear fitted, along with a much-needed overhaul of her aging machinery. Finishing that in September 1934, Hermes returned to China once again. She would remain in Asian waters from 1935 through 1937. While this would not be a particularly exciting time, Hermes did get another pair of events of note. For example, soon after arriving, Hermes launched her torpedo aircraft to intimidate pirates who had hijacked a British flag merchant ship. This was in February 1935, and saw a handful of her fairy seal torpedo bombers used in the process. The pirates, probably wise enough to know when to give up, promptly abandoned the merchant and fled. As for the second notable event, that came in 1935 as well. That was to help search for Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, who had vanished in an attempted record-breaking flight from London to Sydney. By December, the search was called off as a failure. The remainder of her time in East Asia would pass without major incident, before Hermes returned to the UK again in 1937. By now, the old carrier was fairly obsolete, and more modern carriers were being laid down. Hermes took part in the coronation review for King George VI, before she was put into reserve. After a brief stint as an accommodation ship, Hermes eventually moved to a role as a training carrier. Although, even at this point, the Royal Navy did intend to improve her anti-aircraft defenses. That, unfortunately, would not end up happening, in the face of all the other ships in dire need of refits. As such, when the Second World War began, Hermes was pulled off training duty without any major modernization. She was only given a single squadron of swordfish, and placed on anti-submarine duty. It is rather telling, really, that Hermes can only operate a dozen biplane torpedo bombers by this point in her career. Regardless, Hermes spent the early days of the war on the anti-submarine duty, before shifting to hunting blockade runners in October of 1939. In this, she operated alongside the French battleship Strasbourg, though it was not going to last long. After all, France would fall in June of 1940. At which point, Hermes ended up being called upon to act in one of several operations by the Royal Navy against the Vichy French fleet. In her case, she began blockade duty against French blockade runners off West Africa. It was in the process of doing so that she was assigned to attack the new battleship Richelieu in Dakar. The first attempt, on July 8th, involved one of Hermes' boats, which was supposed to drop depth charges off the battleship's stern, to disable her rudder and propellers. This apparently failed, not because the French stopped the boat, but because the water was too shallow to set off the depth charges. I'm not sure if I'm more amazed that the French somehow failed to stop the boat, or that the British were crazy enough to try something like that in the first place. Though there seems to be some contradiction on if the boat attacked alone, or in concert with swordfish carrying torpedoes. In any event, while the boat attack failed, the attack by the swordfish was rather more successful. This landed a torpedo hit to the stern, and caused severe damage to the battleship. It's a shame that Hermes' most successful combat action was against a former ally, but that's how things were in that stage of the war. For her part, Hermes wouldn't escape damage in turn. A month later, on August 10th, she collided with the armed merchant cruiser Corfu in foggy weather. This caused enough damage to her bow that Hermes had to sail to South Africa for proper repairs. Upon conclusion of those repairs in November 1940, the carrier returned to hunting for enemy shipping. This time she would sail through the South Atlantic and Indian Ocean on the prowl for commerce raiders. Her mission would gradually work Hermes closer and closer to her old East Asian stomping grounds, though not before a brief detour to support operations in Iraq. 
after which she returned to hunting for enemy shipping, including the elusive Admiral Scheer. By November 1941, however, Hermes desperately needed a refit, which she got in South Africa on November 18th. After leaving there in January of 1942, the Admiralty fully intended for Hermes to sail for Australia to support operations against Japan. This was not meant to be, however, as Hermes instead stuck around Ceylon with the rapid pace of Japanese advancements. It would be here that she ultimately met her fate. While preparing to support a British invasion of Madagascar, the Japanese struck Ceylon several times. The first attack on April 5, 1942 struck Colombo. This, understandably, put the British on edge. When they received advance warning of another raid on April 9th, Hermes set sail with HMAS Vampire for escort. Hermes left, with her aircraft having already flown ashore earlier that month. With the carrier no longer carrying any aircraft, not that swordfish were any sort of fighter escort, this was a risky decision. So risky that, when the British were sighted by the Japanese, Hermes was promptly ordered to turn back around to get under land-based air cover. Air cover that didn't materialize in time, not to the extent that Hermes needed. The Japanese attacked with nearly 100 aircraft, mostly dive bombers, against two aging ships that had extremely limited anti-aircraft defenses. In spite of the prompt arrival of six Fulmars, Hermes was doomed. Some 40 500-pound bombs slammed into the carrier, setting her ablaze and causing uncontrollable flooding. The six Fulmars, with six more late arrivals, managed to down a handful of dive bombers at the cost of two of their own number. Beneath them, HMS Hermes slipped beneath the waves with the loss of 307 of her crew. Vampire was also sent to the bottom, with eight of her crew killed. The captains of both ships were among those lost. While the wreck of Vampire hasn't been found, the wreck of Hermes was first located in 1967. Unrest in Sri Lanka would lead to the wreck fading from popular imagination. Hermes would only be rediscovered in 2002 at a depth of roughly 60 meters. But, well, that's a topic for Sunday's video. I will round off this one with a fun fact. For a brief time, there were two HMS Hermes floating around. Or rather, the British were up to their usual tricks in World War II and disguised the ship as another ship. They took the SS Mamari III, originally SS Zealandic, and converted her to look like Hermes, complete with a fake flight deck, a painted elevator, and a fake island. This was in June 1941, and she struck a submerged wreck while trying to evade German attack on June 3rd. Before she could be salvaged, the fake Hermes was promptly torpedoed by German e-boats, rendering her too damaged to bother salvaging. There's something to be said for both of these ships being sunk by enemy action. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.